Welcome to the final webinar in our Investigations in Corporate Crime series. Today we're going to look at managing a crisis and in particular handling public statements and social media during an emerging and a developing crisis. Your presenters today are myself, uh, Natasha Durkin, and my colleague, Liam McLean. We both work in the reg regulation and markets team here in Sheffield and Wedderburn. You've all been placed on mute to minimise, minimise background noise. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat function and we'll answer as many of these as possible at the end. We're always happy to follow up direct with anyone afterwards, so please do get in touch if you want to continue the conversation. So turning to the overview, in today's webinar, we'll speak about some key considerations around communications during a crisis situation. Of course, there's communicating with the public at large, but also with employees, investors, regulators, and the media. So we'll start with some rules of thumb and the importance of planning. We'll also discuss some of the consequences and legal implications of public statements and the use of social media before explaining whether any lessons can be learned from how some high-profile crises have been dealt with recently. There are a lot to pick from, as everybody knows, and Liam will speak about the BP Gulf of Mexico oil spill in 2010 and also the recent Volkswagen emissions testing scandal. Our aim today really is to highlight some of the key things and issues you need to think about, some of the rules of thumb, and the mistakes organisations and individuals can easily make. When a crisis occurs, it can really be difficult to know what to deal with first, how to prioritise, and this all gives rise to the risk that nothing gets dealt with properly or that important areas are mishandled or indeed overlooked. This is especially difficult when the crisis is unexpected and fast-moving when key people only have limited information and the accuracy of the information you have cannot be guaranteed. One of the most challenging aspects of any crisis is dealing with calls and emails from the press, from concerned members of the public or employees, from industry or consumer bodies or indeed government, whilst you try to deal with the actual crisis itself. This is especially true when a crisis is evolving and there is incomplete information. However, the reputational damage from mishandling public statements and comments can be really significant and the damage can be difficult to remedy. And Liam's going to speak about BP's experiences in the Gulf. I mean, that really is an extreme example of how things can go very wrong indeed, both for the corporate and for individuals. And it can be very, very hard to regain reputation once it's lost. What this means is that you have to have a strategy, I think, for limiting and for managing reputation damage and, as importantly, to act on it. If the situation you're faced with interests the press, it's simply not an option to ignore them or to treat them as your enemy. If you have press interest, then use this as a way to communicate. And communication is one of the absolute keys to good crisis management. Making a no-comment type statement looks defensive and is likely to be detrimental. It looks like you've got something to hide, and of course the press won't like it. Refusing to comment leaves a communication gap that can and most likely will be filled with unhelpful speculation and comment. So what are the rules of thumb? Well, the first is to recognise that you have to communicate, and you should be as forthright as you can. The lawyers, myself included, will caution you to say nothing out of a fear of prejudicing your organisation's position, or providing incorrect or misleading information. Lawyers will be especially concerned that comments can and most likely will be picked over by regulators or by prosecutors or end up being relevant in court proceedings. Lawyers are cautious and don't want clients to become trapped by admissions of liability. This then leads lawyers to caution against seeing anything at all. It seems to me that this really isn't a credible position to take in an evolving crisis and simply doesn't work as a strategy in a world with instant communication tools. You want to get to a position where you have a robust and a balanced approach to communications that protects corporate liability if it needs to be protected, but gives information, and that often will mean nothing more than reassurance to the public or indeed others. 
So a classic example of this is the Pepsi hypodermic syringe hoax in 1993 in the US. Now, there were initial reports that hypodermic syringes had been found in bottles of Pepsi, and this quickly grew to around 50 reports within a few weeks. Pepsi didn't order a recall, as it was absolutely convinced that the reports were hoaxes. What they then embarked on was a communication strategy that was designed to prove the allegations were wholly false. So what they saw, they saw Pepsi opening the doors of all their bottling plants, adopting an approach of aggressive transparency to all their work, all customer queries were answered, all stakeholders received twice daily updates, and the CEO was completely available to the media. In 11 days, Pepsi ran adverts saying, Pepsi is pleased to announce nothing. What's really interesting about this example is that within hours of Pepsi implementing the strategy, the media was starting itself to use words like hoax and copycats. The message was getting through, and Pepsi was changing the terms of the debate. And Pepsi also involved independent third parties, notably the Food and Drug Administration, to corroborate their claim that the reports were a hoax. There is a real trend for governments and for organisations to apologise or to express empathy for actions. Whilst it is important, and I think in many circumstances is probably crucial to take responsibility, that seems to me to be very different from exacting blame. Taking responsibility is all about communicating the steps that are being taken to remedy a situation. But of course, here the choice of words is really vital in, convey in conveying the right message. You don't want people to think that you're washing your hands of a situation or indeed that you're minimising it. Explaining what you're doing to fix the problem, or if appropriate, expressing sympathy or regret are messages that can strike the right balance. Denials will also affect credibility. It's especially true if you should have known something or if someone could reasonably think that you should know something. And again, this is, this is difficult. You may not have a complete understanding of the position, and of course this can easily lead to speculation. This can be especially harmful to reputation, especially if speculation is wrong. So don't speculate, but do provide accurate information so far as you can. And if the information turns out to be wrong, then quickly correct it. And what this is all part of is your ongoing communication strategy. Getting the message right to the public in the initial stages and being seen to take responsibility to deal with the implications of whatever the crisis are, are invaluable in trying to protect the reputation of the organisation and ensuring it can rebuild if it needs to. Getting the words right is hard and usually needs both communication experts, lawyers and key management input. You should also think about the messages that you need to send to different stakeholders, employees, investors, regulators, the media, the public. In many situations, your organisation may have to give clear and practical advice to the public. For example, when there's a health scare, a range of authorities have to work together to ensure that public health information is accurately and thoroughly disseminated. Make sure you think about how best to communicate. That could be getting a website up and running quickly, using Twitter and social media, all to ensure your message is made public and communicated. And of course, what all of this means is that you should have a plan. The importance of crisis planning cannot be overstated. It's invaluable as good planning forces organisations and individuals to think through the full range of issues that need to be addressed in advance. Working through the plan allows you to game scenarios, to find out what works, where weaknesses are, and the types of risks your organisation faces. For example, how do you know when you have a crisis? That might seem obvious, but it isn't always the case. Many issues can bubble under the surface for months or for weeks before they escalate suddenly. Some may come to nothing, others may be averted if you deal with them, and others can escalate sometimes unnecessarily. One of the challenges is recognising what a crisis will look like for your organisation. The planning process is a really good way, and probably the only way actually, to start to think through likely risks and red flags that your organisation might face. A key element of any plan is your strategy for dealing with public statements, as we've already discussed, for dealing with the press and dealing with government 
in other agencies. Understanding how your lines of communication work minimises confusion and having known points of contact and agreement as to who will say what and when should ensure internal clarity. Now, of course, it is impossible to predict every possible situation. But at the moment, for example, do you know who would talk to the press, who would talk to regulators or industry bodies or the local MP when she calls, who will be responsible for ensuring the lawyers are happy with the communication strategy? Do you already have third party PR advisor in place if you need one? And critically, who's going to manage social media for you? How will they decide what to respond to and how? And how will you ensure that red tape is minimised to ensure that it is done quickly, as quickly as possible? A very significant issue in practice is making sure that key people focus on the right issues and aren't distracted by side issues. So how will you ensure that? It's also worth considering what will happen if your primary spokesperson is either involved personally in the situation or is conflicted or perhaps is indisposed. So who's going to step up to ensure that the organisation continues to run smoothly and make decisions about what will be said to the press and also explain why they are figureheading the crisis and not, say, for example, the chief executive. A policy should be discussed as to who will speak with employees and deal with any concerns that they may have. They will be dealing with ongoing business on the ground and will be in contact with the public, clients and customers, and they need to give a consistent message to those third parties. They may also have concerns for their own positions and the trade unions may be involved. We will talk a bit later about managing the risk of employees' comments to the public in a crisis situation as well. So turning to the legal risks of public statements, of course, that, as everyone knows, there are legal risks in speaking publicly, but there is, I think, a distinction between taking responsibility for dealing with a situation, which generally speaking will be treated positively, whilst not accepting liability or blame from a legal perspective or indeed prejudicing the company's position in any subsequent regulatory, criminal or civil investigation or legal proceedings. Lawyers' caution can help ensure statements minimise risks, but these should be designed to support the organisation's overall communication strategy, and I don't think that should be driven exclusively by lawyers. It should be the team working together. It's also worth noting an interesting development in Scotland related to a particularly difficult issue in managing crisis situations, and that's apologies. There's often a great deal of fear that making an apology will prejudice your legal position and may even amount to an admission of liability. The Apology Scotland Bill is a private member's bill currently working its way through the Scottish Parliament. And the bill aims to give certainty that an apology cannot be used against an apologising party as definitive evidence of liability. It's hoped the um, promoters of the bill wish that if it becomes law, it will allow parties to make more apologies more openly and in turn that this will help both victims and uh, the resolution of disputes. Don't forget to notify your um, insurers, for example, and know where the policy is. There can also uh, be a tendency to try to blame others in an attempt to deflect some of the pressure that's being felt. One of the risks here is of defamation or somebody being libelled. This is increasingly likely given the availability of social media, of course. Remember that nothing is truly off the record and that any off-the-cuff remark, whether verbal or on social media, could be the source of action. So, for example, fairly recently, Lord McAlpine was linked to a name of, a, of alleged child abusers that was passed to the Prime Minister during a broadcast on ITV, and then the allegations spread over Twitter. This resulted in uh, Lord McAlpine raising an unprecedented series of legal actions against Twitter users for libel, and that was against even those who didn't name Lord McAlpine but provided a link to material potentially um, defaming him. In a recent case here in Scotland, a B&B owning couple took the owners of TripAdvisor to court. Here it was unsuccessful due to jurisdictional issues in an attempt to get them to release the details of TripAdvisor users who posted allegedly defamatory reviews of their hotel. 
you really need to be alive to statements made by third parties in your online spaces when managing your legal risks. And the issue of libelous or defamatory statements in the social media context is certainly one of increasing importance. Research last year by Thomson Reuters suggested that there would be a 300% rise in claims related to social media libel or defamation in 2013-14 alone. Given how prevalent social media is to everybody's lives, there is little suggestion that this increase is likely to be transitory. You should also control, consider the control of legal privilege in communicating with lawyers and PR companies at a very early stage and at the planning stage. Ensure you control the flow of information and give thought to establishing a core client team for the purposes of engaging with lawyers. Be careful about forwarding or circulating information or documents unnecessarily. Think about data protection or potential freedom of information requests that could result in disclosure of any information. Regulators and litigation will involve document recovery processes, just so try to maximise the potential for privilege covering those communications about the crisis when you're planning your, your crisis communication strategy. And finally, of course, if there are implications from employees, Ensure you understand how to communicate with them in a way that complies with, say, for example, any contractual requirements. Try to avoid information being leaked if that's at all possible. But if there are inaccuracies that are in the public domain, then correct these. The effective use of social media is obviously essential for organisations, and many organisations encourage employees to join social networks. Of course, there are real risks here, both for employers and for employees themselves. And bad news travels really fast on social media. So, look at the, a recent example of a McDonald's restaurant in Craigieburn. It's a suburb of Melbourne in Australia. In June this year, a regular customer of the restaurant posted a Facebook message complaining about the level of service she'd received in a recent visit. Two employees, one of whom was a store manager, responded directly to this post by directing abuse at the customer, calling her a, for example, low life and telling her she should, quote, go run on a treadmill, end quote. Quickly and totally unsurprisingly, local media picked up on the story and the aggrieved customer was uh, being interviewed on in TV, stating she felt, quote, humiliated and, quote, bullied. McDonald's then dismissed the two employees and made public statements apologising to the customer concerned and underlining the fact that they expected their employees to treat customers with respect at all times, whether off or online. An Australian social media expert commented on the case at the time, if you're working for a business or brand, especially one with such a high profile as McDonald's, you have to understand the employee guidelines regardless of if you're facing the customer or sitting behind a keyboard. Indeed, a user policy that clearly sets out how an employer expects its employees to engage with social media in general terms, who owns the account should employment N, for example, can be really helpful in these circumstances. It creates a formal framework that can be relied on where necessary in litigation and is an essential requirement in every employment contract. As I'm sure most of you are aware, it's possible to create a link between your status updates on LinkedIn and your Twitter account. The effect is that anything you post in on your LinkedIn account will simultaneously be tweeted and vice versa. However, problems can arise when a LinkedIn account is connected to a company Twitter account that is operated by more than one user. Used correctly, this can allow employees to feed the company Twitter page with updates such as forthcoming events or current awareness. However, the more people that are given access, obviously, the greater the risk for errors or things going wrong. And it can go badly wrong when these employees also have personal accounts and a personal post that is offensive or intemperate ends up in the company account and gives rise to company or organisational liability. Social media is a reputational minefield. Everybody has seen posts and tweets made without thinking, and the reply all email, whilst often very amusing, is a real hazard. Even those you would think had more sense can begin posting their own thoughts without thinking about it. If you're going to allow employees to connect their LinkedIn account to a Twitter account that is not exclusively their own, 
it's important to ensure that this is restricted to specific members of staff and that there's a clear policy in place and a robust takedown mechanism. Once they're out there, the chances are somebody will get a screen grab of it before you have a chance to take it down, so you need to be able to act quickly. If you have the resources, ideally having someone on a team who is monitoring social media and blogs, both as a crisis emerges, to try to quash rumours, and as a crisis develops, to disseminate information and set the record straight. With the potential for retweets, that can be a powerful and very effective preemptive tool. I'll now hand over to Liam to look at uh, a couple of case studies. Good afternoon, everybody. The first case study that we're going to look at is the recent Volkswagen emissions scandal. Given the level of media coverage that this scandal has attracted to date, um, we're all likely aware of the main facts, but nonetheless, it's probably uh, worth briefly summarising some of the background. So, in September this year, the US Environmental Protection Agency found that many VW cars that had been sold in the US over a number of years had been installed with what is known as a defeat device. This is a device and some accompanying software which can be installed in a diesel engine that could detect when they were being tested and alter the performance accordingly to improve their test results. This meant that VW cars went onto the market in the US despite emitting nitrogen oxide pollutants up to 40 times above the legal limit. These initial EPA accusations were relevant to around 482,000 cars in the US. Shortly after these EPA reports became public, it also came to light that many millions of cars in Europe may have also been fitted with similar devices. It appeared that due to different emissions testing rules under EU law, VW would not need to contend with the exact same overarching legal issue. However, VW do face legal claims on a number of different bases in different European countries. For example, in the UK, it's been suggested that VW could be prosecuted on a number of grounds, including for a breach of motor vehicle regulations, breaches of consumer law, and also, most seriously, for fraud. So, how are VW dealing with this crisis? First of all, there was an immediate acceptance that VW had done wrong. We've totally screwed up said VW America boss Michael Horn, while the group's chief executive at the time, Martin Wintercorn, said his company had, quote, broken the trust of our customers and the public, end quote. While quick and clear apologetic statements like these may not be appropriate in every case, when it's clear that problematic activity, uh, such as the VW emission scandal, um, has been indulged in, accepting this unequivocally can be beneficial. The public tends to take a dim view of organisations that set, set themselves against reality, but often appreciate a clear acceptance that something has went wrong. Also, there were clear consequences for those involved. Mr Wintercorn resigned as a direct result of the scandal and was replaced by a VW executive who had not been involved. The VW also announced the launch of an internal inquiry. Proactively and publicly taking action to deal with the issue at the heart of a crisis can often be beneficial. It reinforces the impression that your organisation understands something has went wrong and also that you are not simply going to wait and deal with the authorities. You are going to sort it out yourself. Another positive point in terms of how VW have been trying to handle uh, this crisis at the, is that they have broadly made clear that they intend to put things right financially. Uh, to that end, have announced that various ports have been set aside to deal with product recalls and redress payments. So up till now, we've been relatively positive about how VW has been handling things. Um, and given how they've handled a potentially cataclysmic scandal, this is probably a fair assessment. Not everything about how they've dealt with matters, though, has been entirely exemplary. Uh, I'm referring to what Bloomberg News called earlier this week as VW's, quote, bad news drip. Over the past two months, there has been a regular reassessment, um, usually in the upward direction, of the number of VW cars affected by the scandal. More and more cars seem to be pulled in from across the globe, sometimes after VW has specifically denied that a particular model or geographical location has been affected. Um, this undermines the public trust in what VW is telling them and cuts across any benefit that they might have got from their initial acceptance of wrongdoing. This also underlines the need to be fully apprised of the facts before you make a statement and not to release statistics or facts that you're not sure are accurate, a point Natasha has already made. 
also it, it perhaps suggests the desirability of getting all the relevant information on a crisis into the public domain in as few bursts as possible, um, at, as Bloomberg would have it, drip feet of bad news over a number of months simply serves to remind the public of what went wrong and also suggests that the aftermath of a crisis isn't being dealt with particularly competently. So, in the round, the VW's response has been mixed. Some positive steps mixed with some negative ones. Only time will tell what the long-lasting effect on their business and brand will be. The second case study we're going to look at this afternoon uh, shows some further lessons that can be learned. In April 2010, the BP oil-owned Deepwater Horizon drilling rig suffered an explosion off the Gulf of Mexico. Eleven workers died and a total of 4.1 million barrels of oil leaked into the sea. BP's shares fell at first but then soared back up on the back of increased fuel prices and a rise in profits. Eventually, though, their share price dropped by 7% and £13 billion pounds was knocked off BP's market valuation. Uh, by June of 2010, BP shares had fell to a 14-year low and Fitch had cut BP's credit rating from AA to BBB and also Moody's had lowered it further to A2. BP has to date paid over $10 billion in compensation as a result of the accident and has also pled guilty to charges including the deaths of the rig workers and also lying to Congress about the size of the spill. Uh, BP eventually agreed to settle the criminal uh, charges for an estimated $4.5 billion in 2012. In May 2010, it also emerged that BP had previously dismissed the possibility a year before that a catastrophic accident could happen at Deepwater Horizon. In congressional hearings, the crisis plan that the company had in place was heavily criticised uh, for various reasons, including a lack of preparedness for something that many saw as predictable, uh, no tailoring of the plan or thought to its terms, errors and miscalculations in the plan, and perhaps most shockingly, a telephone number of a recommended wildlife expert who had died a number of years before. BP were criticised for confusing the position with technical explanations as well, and also for it taking 87 days to find and implement an appropriate solution. At the same time, they provoked a strong public reaction when they announced that £6.8 billion in dividends was to be issued to their shareholders shortly after the accident. Whilst there was a number of technical difficulties that diminished the public's confidence in BP, the, reputa the reputational damage was, however, worsened because of the media criticism of Tony Hayward, the group's chief executive. He came under fire personally for his public dealing with the split. Quotes were attributed to him, such as telling the BBC that BP, quote, will not be judged on the basis of an accident that you know was frankly not our accident. Also telling the Guardian newspaper that, quote, the Gulf of Mexico is a very big ocean. The volume of oil and dispersant we are putting into it is tiny in relation to the total, total water volume, end quote. And also at a press conference, he told reporters, quote, there's no one who wants this over more than I do. I would like my life back." End quote. In the meantime, his chairman, Carl Henrik Svanberg, was quoted as saying, We care about the small people. He also came under severe criticism for being photographed on a yacht in the aftermath of the spill, while communities in the Gulf of Mexico were still suffering terribly due to the event. We spoke in our last webinar about the increased regulatory fo focus on directors' personal liabilities, uh, and this is certainly something that comes out in the BP case as Tony Hayward was forced to resign in the aftermath of the crisis. He subsequently admitted that the company was not prepared to deal with the media frenzy following the spill. In terms of lasting effect on reputations, even now BP is finding that it, it's the company's reaction to the crisis that people will remember, not necessarily the crisis itself. Only last year, Forbes magazine ran an article querying whether BP's brand image had recovered from Deepwater Horizon, and earlier this year there was a raft of five years on articles, which, as well as recirculating images of the awful environmental impact of the spill, brought up once again BP's argument with poor handling of the crisis. On a different tact, of course, there are the crises that you don't hear about, and that's really where the real art in all of this lies. I came across a blog recently on the, the blog Crisis Blogger, in which, it was com in which it commented on a good PR job done by the fashion house DKNY. 
The blogger commented that DKNY had been negotiating to buy some images from a prominent photographer, that before agreement could be reached, the images had showed up in their store window. Before this could hit the press, though, DKNY had resolved the issue. They quickly identified the problem, offered an apology and explanation to the photographer affected, made him the appropriate payment of $25,000, and smoothed things over with him uh, in general terms. A similarly well-handled crisis from the social media sphere was how Southwest Airlines in the US dealt with a landing accident at, La, at LaGuardia Airport in 2013. In that case, a Southwest flight landed nose first, causing damage to the plane and injuries to a number of passengers. Within minutes, Southwest had released a brief statement advising that the issues were being dealt with and that further details would be released as soon as possible. They then, as information became available, released clear information on what was being done to deal with the situation. The social media reaction to Southwest Twitter and Facebook accounts was overwhelmingly positive, with many consumers thanking them for their quick and clear communications on the accident. So, now to sum up, what have we discussed today? Firstly, that making public statements whilst handling a crisis is difficult, but that getting it right can limit damage. Perhaps the most important takeaway is to have a plan, working through it and keeping it up to date. You can plan for every eventuality, but having a plan will really help you take the right decisions. As part of your plan, get a team in place and know your team as well. A mix of lawyers and communications experts is usually good, but really importantly, don't neglect your own staff and get key people appropriate training so that they feel confident in dealing with difficult situations. The same goes for social media. Finally, think about strategy. The crisis will pass. What is important is having a strategy that everyone understands and works towards. Getting to a place where there are no announcements to make is a good place in and of itself. So, I think that uh, concludes today's webinar. No one has offered any questions on the chat function, and I think we're about two minutes over our allocated half an hour slot. Um, but as ever, please do feel free to drop myself and or Natasha an email with any follow-up queries. We'd be more than happy to, to have a chat to you about them. Uh, thanks a lot for attending, and thanks.